Hello, everybody. My name is Tim Grieving. I'm the moderator today. Welcome to this transatlantic multimedia cyberspace futuristic conversation. Um, very excited for this uh, discussion. Um, first of all, imagine a post apocalyptic world ravaged by climate change, governments collapsing, neighbors fighting neighbors a global disease that isolates the population of the entire planet and makes us all suspicious of each other, escalating tensions higher and higher. But we're not here to talk about the news. We're here to talk about Battlefield 2042. Um, I wanna welcome our distinguished panelists, uh, the composers of Battlefield 2042, Hilda Daughter and Sam Slater, piping in from Germany. Uh, the lead audio designer of Battlefield 2042, Andreas Alstrom. Hello. And the head of music, the chief, the big kahuna at Electronic Arts, Steve Schnur. Hi. Is, that, is big kahuna on your business card, Steve? No, but I'm going to get a different business card now, thanks to you, Tim. I'm, I'm big in that. <laughs> Just credit where credit's due, if you will. Um, so... So there's so much to, to to chew on here, and obviously we're all at a bit of a handicap because most of us have not played this game or or experienced it. So there's a bit of a mystery, a bit of a speculative nature to this. But one of the things that I want to do with this panel is sort of demystify, but also illuminate and elevate what it means to score a video game, a modern video game. And Steve, I know that's something you're passionate about. And I know there's a lot of confusion, misunderstanding, preconceptions, uh, misconceptions about game music, the process of scoring a game, the art of scoring a game, um, the art of, of music and sound in a game. And Hilder and Sam, you're kind of the perfect uh, guinea pigs and uh, test cases for that, because I imagine that the two of you got a real education in understanding what goes into this art form in real time by doing it. Is that fair to say? Oh yeah, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Well, I'm just curious, first off, what your relationship, the two of you, the, your relationship to games prior to this and what were, what were some of those preconceptions or misunderstandings that you might've brought into it about games? Well, my relationship to games uh, and it, its trail in, I want to say, 1991 with uh, Petrus. <laughs> That's uh, kind of, uh, you know, the last time that I really uh, played any played any games, uh, and 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 I realized at that point, I'm I'm kind of uh, a little bit obsessive by nature, and uh, I got kind of. A little bit too obsessed with Tetris, so when I closed my eyes, I was kind of I saw Tetris blocks <laughs> <in the rock laughs> going down. <laughs> so, so I realized that games was maybe something that I should be kind of a little bit um, careful with if I wanted to do anything else with my life. <laughs> And this can go for anything like, you know, playing solitaire or Sudoku or, you know, something as, as mundane without or knitting. Like I have to be kind of like, you know, careful with what I get sucked into. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so games was definitely one of those things. But I think that, I think like when, uh, when Steve approached us, I think that's kind of uh, what he was looking for because uh, he, was was uh, really looking. He was he was very determined to do a game score that was um, that had never been done before. Like he was he was really determined to 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 I, th I think work with someone that was kind of completely outside of the the world. You know that kind of mm -hmm. didn't really have. You know it's kind of it's kind of really easy to go outside of the box when you have no idea what the box is. You know then you just kind of you're not kind of restricted with anything you know so so uh, um so i kind of found that quite exciting because it was so you know it was it was so alien to me like it was <laughs> no idea what was going to be going on mm -hmm. so i could kind of approach it with with um uh like a total beginner's mind because i just like i didn't really i had no history and i had no you know no 
context and it definitely you know obviously never played battlefield you know even though it's been happening for for 20 years but um yeah so that's my that's my experience mm. Sam maybe has a little bit more i i played a few more games i mean honestly like played some counter-strike when i was when i was younger and uh, you know i think i've they've been peripheral uh, peripheral to my sort of yeah my life for a, for a <laughs> while but i haven't really hadn't really ducked into them for quite a long time uh and but still i think had an idea or had some ideas some some true some less true about the ways in which music could really be used to sort of animate these animate these worlds and um uh, that seemed like a really specifically uh, exciting challenge just you know the brain instantly gets excited by the, the lack of linearity and the, the the real openness that's available to you in a you know in a both technical sense and a creative sense um it was instantly quite a quite an exciting challenge i'm just yeah and i think we kind of both saw it as we we saw it as a like because i mentioned the box before like you know i think i think what was exciting to us with this with this format and what, kind of why we decided to to join this uh, journey was the kind of the aspect of of it like not being a box but a circle, you know, because because like because the non-linear mm. relationship to to the time and the story that you know because when you're working and when you're working with the film, you know, which is something that we kind of have more experience with, that's kind of a linear process where things have a beginning and an end and, and uh, it's kind of fixed in time mm. and, and space, but but what we found so um, exciting about this medium was the kind of the um, interactive non-linearity of of, uh, of, the, of this world and the kind of the, and the incredible like uh, um, opportunities that that has that, that comes with that with that format with, mm. with that with that just like the the engines that you're working with like what they're capable of doing these computer processors nowadays and and like what how people react to them. You know, a lot has evolved since Tetris. I, I realize. <laughs> Hilder, I just I just went into your your sound installation at the Academy Museum, uh, which is amazing. But uh, clearly, you're not. This isn't the first time you thought outside the box. I think you are <laughs> someone who doesn't need to think linearly. Um, but everyone should check that out if you're in Los Angeles. Um, Steve, I haven't seen it myself. I'm so excited to see it. I'm that's so great. Jealous. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> Steve, um, what, why and how did you end up approaching Hilda and Sam uh, for this project? Well, I've been working on the Battlefield franchise for since its since its inception almost. Um, and the variations of ways to approach it musically with a very sticky theme song that everybody in the world knows. Um, and yet this one, um, despite your joke before, which was very good, you also described the world of Battlefield 2042. Um, what's interesting about your description is that it's in the not so distant future. So half the things, if not more, the things you mentioned are already happening, let alone highly likely to happen. So um, how do you approach a franchise musically um, as a music supervisor, as Joel alluded to before, um, and set a tone for a new part of the franchise that is completely disruptive, that completely throws everything off its normal kilter, you know, and we keep using the term here out of the box. Um, and frankly, personally, how do I approach two people who had just won a Brit, some Grammys? A Golden Globe it was pretty good. If I had uh, DraftKings, I probably would have bet heavily that they were going to win the Oscar. Um, fly to Berlin <laughs> in my last pre-COVID, pre-lockdown. None of us knew it was going to happen. And spend an hour and change at Soho House, trying to convince uh, somebody to do a game that's never done a game before, and. I think it come, there was a few reasons why. Number one, 
Now, I'm not new to the world of Hilder and Sam. I'm obsessive to everything they did previous to their current recognition. Um, and I've paid attention to almost every note they've written through, you know, their own work, through Sicario, through their con contributions to Arrival and other things like that. And so the one thing that I said to Hilder was, I'm not here. I don't want you to do Joker and I don't want you to do, to do Chernobyl. That's not why I'm here. I'm not here to be a follower who just got this. I actually just know that you guys have the talent, the extraordinary talent to create a unique soundscape, to create a new world that is completely disrupted, disrupted to everything we've ever known. I actually want to shake it up so much that I want people to turn off the game and go, what was that? I want people to be able to listen to the album outside of the game and think that they're and know that they're listening to one of the greatest instrumental albums. I'm going to use this term loosely, heavy metal albums. I don't mean Black Sabbath, but I mean just, you know, something that shakes you to the core. Um and can we do it in such a disruptive fashion that we even talked about not going to Abbey Road atypically and recording 70 instruments in a 40 piece string section? How do we create a blur between sound design and score that's so unimaginable to people um, at this point? How do the helicopter guns, you don't know if they're guns or they're a percussive instrument? How do we get there? And how do we take this medium, which you're right, is underlooked at times. I think people are so, particularly adults, are so comfortable in the mediums we know and we grew up with, the beginning and the middle and the end of a film, that they don't know the possibilities of what can happen with nonlinear score and nonlinear mediums in general. Um, so. I just, if I could pat myself on the back for one thing, it's in this case, I was a really good casting director because I knew before we even hired them, that I didn't have a number two or three idea. This was it. And if Hilder and Sam had said, no, I was going to walk away with my hand in my head going, oh God, what am I going to do now? <laughs> because this was the answer because a disruptive world in the very near future deserves a disruptive soundscape. And I think as Hilder and Sam and I had become close friends over the last, you know, we did this whole thing during COVID. So, so uh, Hilder, I've met Sam. I can't wait to see. It. I mean, I can't believe I consider him one of my closest friends of a year and a half. And I don't even know how tall he is, for God's sake. It's bizarre. Um, for all I know, he's going to be six foot nine. Um, but it's it's a much different thing. Nothing else in air is pretty well. <laughs> air gets in there. Um, you know, if this, if there was no pandemic, I would have been to Berlin and Sweden five, six times. We would have met with groups. We would have had a lot of outside influence because we would have been a lot of meetings with other people. And I think what this allowed us was for me to ensure and keep them always out of the box. When other people, whether it's the film, TV, game, whatever, want to pull people into the box, my job was to go, no, stay out of the box. The vision from day one, people aren't supposed to get this on the first listen. They're so, supposed to be so disturbed that they don't know what they just experienced. Does that answer the question, Tim, or did I completely go left? Sorry. You answered it. Okay. It raises several other questions, but. Uh... <laughs> okay, good. Hilder, Sam, um, did you need to be convinced at all? I mean, were you were you uh, trepidatious or or resistant at all at first to the idea of, of doing a game? Sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it's like I, I think when when you don't really know. Um, like a when you don't know a medium and and b i think the you know i have i had my questions about like you know people running around shooting other people you know i have to be like completely honest about that that i was Sorry. like 
do we need really need to contribute to that? You know, you, you were, but you were, you were we day, had that conversation from day one. You were concerned about that. That was valid. That was really valid. Yeah, exactly. I was like, you know, is, is that really, you know, because, because, you know, computer games are also like I was just saying before this, um, I was just saying before this meeting started, like, you know, I, I have a lot of questions about how much time we spent in front of computers in general. <laughs> so, so I was, you know, I had questions about like whether or not I should contribute to people spending more time in front of computers. Mm. But, um, but I think what we, what, what we really found very kind of important. And I think like, you know, whenever you choose, uh, or, you know, choose or, or take on or start the project that you know you're going to be spending a, a significant amount of time on, you kind of have to examine like, okay, so how does this project align with, you know, my beliefs and my interests and, and you know, what, 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 you know, where I stand in the world and, and how can I, you know, so, so therefore like how can I connect to it and how can I con contribute to it? And I think... <clears throat> You know, aside from just like the kind of curiosity about the medium as like, you know, what we talked about the non-linearity and all of that, what really, what really drew us in and what we thought was, um, you know, not just like very important as a subject matter is just like the, 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 the subject of the game, like the story of the game is like, you know, the people which are running around shooting each other is kind of secondary to to what's happening in the game like mm -hmm. the, the backdrop to 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 the shooting you know that the environment that that we have <clears throat> we have created and are creating you know and, and this kind of this looming threat of of this existence that that like the us <laughs> we we've I mean, created for ourselves you know mm -hmm. with with climate change what does that mean and, and what how how does that how, what is our connection with it what can we do about it what what's you know all these questions are like really important to us and something that like is, is a subject that we think about a lot so so that was um that was what really made us decide to to uh, mm -hmm. to 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 be a part of this project was that what, that we just think this um the subject uh uh is really important you know you know what was um what was interesting from day one was we said that we kind of look together at battlefield battlefield um is not a game uh, of, about shooting people you know it's a game with deep story that involves war as a result of what's happening in the world um and you know, we're in the storytelling business, and and I think we connected deeply on that from the very beginning. That we had a story to tell, musically. Um, and and Battlefield, yeah. Battlefield has always been about uh, making an anti-war statement. It's never been about glorifying, exactly. even though it happens all the time. Uh, the sort of in the back of our head that dies. It's 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 always about telling the the sort of the gritty realistic uh, part of war and um then being respectful and saying war is kind of shit. Let's make sure it's it's not just uh, major harmonics and uh, and uh, stuff like that. So it is super important to not romanticize uh, a global conflict that's. Even though it's it's made up, it's it's very relatable. Yeah, absolutely. I also just think, like for us, the in both of our, you know, in both of our practices, we've been thinking about we've been uh, making work that is relating to the question of you know of climate change and what's happening in the world currently and what will happen in the not so distant future, and I think it struck us as an incredible opportunity knowing that this this game that these incredible worlds that were being built uh were going to house you know millions and millions of people that will be affected by or also have the opportunity to affect this subject and what greater um i don't see a greater chance really to make a piece of music make a piece of art make a contribution to a discussion that will get the opportunity to to to, to engage with that many people. I think mm. 
I think that Absolutely. that strike struck us both as a huge opportunity to, to yeah. you know, to because it's a medium that like, you know, it just like it reaches so many people. So, you know, I mean, how many, I don't know, 50 million people or whatever that play this game. And you know that they're all going to be, you know, consciously or subconsciously, like while playing this game, they're also going to raise questions about climate change and possibly, you know, take some action, you know, in, in that, you know, in, in, you know, for, yeah. you know, against, against climate change. Or yeah. you, I mean, you know, it's just like that. It's like, where, where do you, where do you, where, you know, because, because also just like, it's a subject that you just feel so, you just feel so, it's like so huge. You feel so power, so powerless against, and you just think like, okay, what can I, as a, as a single person, like, what can I possibly contribute to, to the, re, you know, the reversal of this, these catastrophes. And then, and then you see people like Greta Thunberg, who is just like this little, you know, little girl from from Sweden who just like you know causes like a massive, a massive, massive change in the, mm. in, the in 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 this uh, regarding the subject. So, so one can only hope that like you know, um, uh, you know, obviously I'm not I'm not saying that any of us is Greta Thunberg. You know, we're probably not going to have that much of an effect. But but like still. Still, um, you know, it just, just, just the fact that that like fifty million people are gonna possibly think like, hey, wait a second, fifty million people are gonna say, hey, wait a second, is there possibly something that I can change in my ways, or that I can do, or that I can contribute? So, so this doesn't, you know, is is there an action that I can take in reality? And the, the kind of the irony of of the situation that happened. Uh, um, while we were working on this game was obviously this 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 like pandemic happened mm. which was just like the whole, a total like real life catastrophe so it was really easy to to score this you know, yeah, yeah, during yeah. during that you know that situation because you're kind of sitting in the middle of a of a catastrophe and you're just like unable to move you're completely confined in your yeah. in your own little space because of basically the situation that you're just scoring. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, talking a bit about the project. So, of course, like there in the year of 2042, the world is, is a complete disaster. And um, uh, several countries have ceased to exist. And that's where we sort of uh, conjure the concept of non-patriated uh, characters. Uh, but also like we like when we were thinking about like how we're going to remove these countries from the planet uh, and how would we motivate that and we were coming up with uh, crazy ideas like yeah there is a global virus that's going to happen and wipe this entire country out and while we were writing it things started to happen in real time almost i mean the the big forest fires in australia that happened and and there's so many <laughs> so many things that just started happening around the world that we sort of already planned because it was feasible to have it in the sort of in the distant future almost so it is scary writing a game about pandemics and uh, then they just suddenly happen it is and and you know what i would ask everybody to do um go to spotify or apple and listen to the score you know, on its own, the game's not out yet, but the score is, and listen to it from that perspective. From minute one to minute 43 or whatever the last minute is, don't listen to it in terms of individual cues. And you'll hear a journey of what, although it represents what the year 2042 is like in the game, it also represents what the experience was over the last 20 months of fear, you know, of disruption in the world, of panic, you know, it, it all is there. And and I'm not using that in a, in a nostalgic way, like, oh, in five years, listen to what 2021 sounded like or 20. That's not what I mean. What I mean is it's a real sonic representative, representative of the upheaval in the world that's happening right now. We just went through it, but guess what? Mm -hmm. It's still happening from climate change to disruption in certain parts of the world. And, you know, life 
isn't always a romantic comedy. And, and every time there's victory, you know, in a, in, in a game or in a film, um, doesn't mean the timpani come in and the horns play and, oh, great, isn't this wonderful? We won. No, you might have won the war, but you're, can you imagine what that must feel like? So I think we really depth and dug into the honest emotion because you got to remember that if and this is why it's so important as tim alluded to before playing a, a seeing a film you know you have we talk about the beginning and middle and an end you have a character on the screen you the music supports that experience and the game it supports your experience <clears throat> times the 50 million people that hilder just alluded to so your individual experience in the game and in the world, that music is responsible to create that emotional response. And that's why I'm never hesitant to say, go listen to the album on its own on Spotify, because you're going to have an emotional response response that's yours. I imagine after 43 minutes, you're going to go, what did I just listen to? Holy crap. Is that, you know, nine inch nails on acid in 30 years from now? What is that? That's crazy. But it's a response that's worth having. It's not a, it's not a sweetened down version of victory. Because victory isn't even necessarily victory. It's something else. It's personal. So, um, yeah, I think that we just wanted to be honest. I don't mean to speak for Hilder and Sam, but, you know, I feel, and Andreas, but I feel like the score was meant to be honest. It was not meant to be a filmic, sweet version with a happy ending of what happens, what could happen. Is that fair enough? Mm -hmm. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but I think what's also important to say, I think, in, in this regard, because it's obviously, you know, it's it's kind of, uh, um, uh, I, th I think, you know, what, what was important for all of us in this process as well is that, okay, it's like what's happening right now is like hella heavy and it's all pretty, like, you know, it's pretty depressing when you think about it. But we have, like, even as individuals, we have the power to take action even how, like, however small and trivial we feel our actions uh, are, it's still within our power to take actions. Like this, like what's happening in this game is still in 2042. Like, you know, we, we are still in 2021 and there's like a lot that can be done in those 20 years. Yeah. You know, and I think yeah. that's something that we found really important to highlight. Like, okay, shit, the world's a pretty fucked up place right now and it has the potential to be even like way more fucked up like if, yeah. if we decide to go down this route but we have the power to you know yeah to 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 do something you know yeah. i think we kept on using the phrase like it's one potential future yeah. so it wasn't a it wasn't a sort of sort of purely synthetic sort of science fiction that's completely dis disassociated from the world we're in it was a very plausible unfortunately a very plausible future but it's one one of several. and to sort of engage with engage with that as one outcome but but honestly speaking for myself it's not the outcome i hope for like mm -hmm. i'd rather not end up in a kind of uh um sort of war over resources um and uh, uh yeah so one possible future i think is the way that we kept saying mm. And I mean, the game itself invents a few sort of steps in the in the lore to make people have more conflict. So it is very much a, a um, an artificial future or a different future. But we're we're making sure to to sort of write into the lore that uh, satellites drop from the sky and everybody starts panicking. So there are a few um, what's it called things that just make things go a bit faster. Catalysts. There you go. Uh, Hilder and Sam, I'm, I'm, there's so many things I want to know about just the, the mechanics of scoring a game versus the mechanics of scoring a film or writing a concert piece, things like that. But let's just start with maybe kind of big storytelling musical concepts that you had for this score. Was there some key that unlocked what this score should feel like or sound like or what the, the palette should be? Yeah. So, I mean, when we um when we first you're gonna put a okay put a log on the fireplace brag uh, I know right yeah. <laughs> um so you know when we were first looking at these levels we realized that 
um, the thing that we were most interested in uh, when looking at the, the concept art was the dialogue ultimately between uh, you've got human to human interaction between these two uh, these the, the two teams that are playing, but then ultimately you have this dialogue between the world and humans in it. And for us, that was the tension that we were most excited by. It's like it's there is within all of these levels there is the possibility that the world just comes in and throws you a curveball, and that could be this weather event. It could be some kind of at random act of chaos or chance that just completely resets the uh, the dynamics between the humans. So there's a sense of futility there that we thought was really kind of exciting. So we're looking at the, suddenly you've got this sort of, this agency of the environment themselves. And we were looking at these like honestly incredible landscapes that the teams have been building. And we were interested to look at the materials themselves, the things within the levels that, that build these landscapes and uh, that subsequently, you know, deconstruct and also deconstruct the, the players themselves. And we're like, okay, well, there's, you know, there's within this, some levels it's based around sand and glass. Some of them it's based around sort of um, like rusted metal and like mud almost. You get these very sort of elemental um, materials that the entire ca characterize each level. I think characterize yeah. each level exactly, and they, they they really create <clears throat> the identity of the world. And we were thinking that since always for us when working together, it's it's largely about creating as little distance between sound design and music as we possibly can. And sound design is part of the level. Suddenly, music can if made from the elements that, you know, that create the visual landscape, create the sound design, if the music really just pulls from that out, um, we could have a completely coherent kind of level environment. So it was, it was really the materials themselves that kind of unlocked the, the compositional process for us. And you did some uh, wild sampling sessions, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we had some fun. Um, we, give, an, uh, give an example of some of the stuff you sampled or, or where you went to gather your sounds for the score. The first, I mean, the first trip we went to, uh, went to North and um, North West France, and uh, we went to uh, an old submarine base and sampled, um, sampled this submarine. Uh, and, and the, the sort of water and space around it as well. And got some really wild and crazy sound from that. And went to an old warship and managed to, um, like, they let us just play with the engine. It's no longer attached to the propeller, thankfully. So I wasn't not driving anything around, uh, but really dug in and found, uh, you know, some really beautiful, beautiful kind of drones and mechanical noise that comes from pretty large old uh, warship engine um what else did we do well then there was a lot there was a lot, a lot of um obviously because of the pandemic we weren't really uh we weren't really able to travel much you know to to uh, um to do these recording sessions but that was also it also kind of made it quite interesting to to um you know, it's like limitations can be so creative, you know, when, mm. when, when you're just like, okay, you know, I, I'm supposed to be creating this like universe, but I'm not allowed to leave my house. You're not actually allowed <laughs> to leave. Yeah. So yeah. you're just like, oh, okay. So how do I, you know, and how, how do I do that? So you have to, you have to basically find uh, elements of this universe, like in, in your backyard, you know, which, it actually turns out that it's you know it's it's all there like all these things mm -hmm. are just like all there like right in front of our noses and it's, it's kind of I think it goes to show a lot of that like you know we were just like always searching so far for for something that's like you know <laughs> mm. staring us in the face so that was kind of it was kind of beauty in that it was it was a real beauty in that because it was a real kind of it was a real interesting practice like finding all these materials just like yeah, like as I said, in our, in, in our backyard. So we did a lot of 
just like kind of uh, um, records of, of, of material like glass and metal and wood and rocks and uh, mm. electricity and and uh, and stuff just like from from our studio yeah you know, which uh, which was really fun built some like there's one built a lot of systems that would help us sort of explore you know okay you've got rocks like what are we going to do with these rocks how can we make rocks come to life in a way that creates you know, if you can put them together, you've got something in that. But you know, how can we bring life into into this? And we had some really interesting interactions to do with, for example, creating like big buckets full of uh, individual um, material elements, and then uh, taking instruments or voices and forcing various parts of the frequency spectrum into like quite large drivers that were hidden under each of these buckets. So as the the voice or as the instrument like finds a resonant frequency that the, the material, material begins to activate and you've got this kind of tumbral material kind of echo that comes off the um comes off the the the, the thing which could be for example Hilda's voice um various instruments that got built to do this and um and then also what we found really interesting was was the the kind of the process of um uh, building instruments and <clears throat> and also and also kind of forcing materials together that didn't really belong with each other like that don't really form the same sound source so we would for example in a lot of these levels there were like there are two two kind of um main elements like <clears throat> for example the um the, the, there's level that's like largely made of glass and sand so we would take you know we would take a, a recording of, of of glass that we had like you know recorded through some like activational process and make we, when we for, forced it together through like a machine learning process so it was like um it's not exactly AI, but it's kind of like next, the next, uh, um, next door neighbor to, to to AI. It's like this kind of machine learning mechanism that 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 forced materials together that really didn't belong to each other yeah. and, and made a sound out of um, made like basically created instruments out of that forcing forcing mm. together of elements. So it's basically like forcing together like. Uh, yeah. um, I can. Um... So we worked with this coder called Andreas Dialoka, um, and he built this 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 algorithm ultimately that that um, it creates profiles of what it thinks a sound sounds like. So to take the example of actually the track that you heard, if anyone was here when when the, the session started, in the background of that you've got um, the chords are. are, are Hilda's voice is the opening signal, but it's the machine has been listening to like hours of recordings of glass ringing, um, and it's trying to resynthesize Hilda's voice with the tumbral and spectral information that it knows about glass. Um, so it's a computer trying to say, "Oh, I'd play it like this if I were a glass." You know, it's like it's forcing its knowledge set onto this this signal um and so what you get it some crazy sounds out there. it's just like it's totally <laughs> wild some of it's really musical and some of it is just complete madness you could never never think that shit up you could never whoa, think whoa. Like, wow. <laughs> whoa. Yeah. what are you <laughs> yeah. um, and we you know you can using similar processes you can take a lot of the ideas from the game actually like you know, ice and um, what was the other one we did with that? Um, ice and salt, something like this. Um, you can take a lot of the sort of really tensions within the levels themselves and create a tension kind of within the process. And we found that really exciting, I think. Um, it's funny to think that you guys might have accidentally brought in the pandemic by doing this game, but now you've maybe also caused the uh, the singularity and the uh, the machine takeover of humanity just by by tampering in god's domain <laughs> um yeah. the machine speaking glass so they're gonna be hard to understand unfortunately 
yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all here's a hell. It was <laughs> Here's a demystifying question, and then anyone can jump in on this one, because I know Steve and Andreas, you you have a lot more experience with this, although I'm curious about the kind of the the, the newbie experience for Hilda and Sam, but um, the, one of the fundamental differences is of a game is that there is someone on the other side participating in the story. There's someone affecting the way the story plays out and thereby the music. So you're you're not dealing with a passive audience or a viewer or a concert goer or a listener. You're dealing with someone who is actually participating, interacting, changing the what you're doing. So how does that affect your process in terms of coming up with music when that's the end result? Well, oh, for one, yeah. we 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 had to be careful with uh, like planning of of stuff that was one big thing that we learned because um because like you know some of these like for example like the metal uh elements you know that were kind of percussive metal sounds could definitely be just like perceived as like banging so if you pan them like really heavily to the left or the right you know the the, the, <laughs> the player yeah. is probably gonna gonna turn to see like what the hell is that <laughs> you know? so there were things like that that you um that was kind of just like learned by by going that you just that you were just like oh yeah of course yeah. like of course like you know the you know the person's gonna turn around and shoot at the sound <laughs> yeah we, so we, we rely very heavily on spatialization when it comes to just the 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 sounds of the world and what's what's threatening to you as a player so having some sort of control over music where uh, where you don't confuse uh, confuse the player into making mistakes. Uh, that's been very, very important. Uh, and, and then, of course, like having the music as the almost a narration of the situation rather than, uh, well, also kind of narration on, on how, how the sort of the current battle is going uh, with all the ins and outs that's happening. So uh, that's been, that's been a, a really interesting uh, journey for us. For sure. I'd like to just add and remind people who don't know Obviously, this group knows, but uh, one of the biggest significant, you know, one of the biggest differences between film, television, episodic television and games is that we've been working on this, you know, almost two years. It was about 18 months, I'm going to guess, something like that. Um, there's no picture, you know, there's just possibilities. Um, occasionally, we would get storyboard, but usually not. We would talk a lot about what ifs, um, but we were never able to talk about here's what the scene looks like and this is what you should compose to. I'm talking in layman's terms here, but I think one of the differences that I've been so obsessed for those of you that know me for so long in this medium is not only is potentially being it potentially untethering or freeing the composer from picture, but um, it is so much depth of music and so much possibility. So much more music is written for this medium. But when you talk about visual media, you know, and music written for visual media, this really is an untethered and personal experience um, for everybody, not just the composer, but for the person on the couch, as you said, Tim, it needs to be as personal to them because the experience is personalized to them. So um, it, it's, it's funny because you and I talked before about this, Tim, you know, games, I think to a lot of adults still feel like, well, my kids play that, but I watch film, you know, that, that world is changing massively. You know, gamers are 40 and 50 and 60 now and gamers are, but can you imagine there's an entire generation, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, who don't even understand the world ever didn't, uh, games always were in their world. Interactivity and choice was always in their world. Even when Black Mirror did their thing two years ago or whatever, where it's like, oh, we're going to give you choices to the story. That was an admission, uh, a, a smart admission on their part of how stories are going to be told in the future because gaming has, such, has, has had such an impact on new generations. So will songs always have a beginning, a middle, and end, a verse, a bridge, and a chorus? 
well, films always have a beginning and a middle. I mean, there's certain filmmakers like J.J. Abrams and others that would say, hell no, we have to pay attention to what's going on in this space, this gaming space, because of the expectation of choice. So uh, while they're answering it very specifically, I'm just giving, hopefully to give a little bit of a broader view here that um, I think every composer needs to understand that the future of storytelling will need to be done this way in some shape, way, shape or form, you know? Um, so that's just my two cents. I think it's fascinating by the way. And I think it's um, important for all of us to acknowledge the fact this medium is not just massive, but it's also important to everybody who's 12, 25. It's, it's their most important form of entertainment. And it's going to change the world in the way entertainment is written and the way it's produced. There's so many, there's so many angles to that, just in terms of, you know, ramifications, audience, the future. And, and I think about the mechanics and just how much sheer volume of music has to be created when there's choice involved, as opposed to just a flat canvas of space that needed to be filled. But I'm Hilda and Sam as as storytellers, as emotional storytellers. What what did this medium? What what did it give you uh, that was new that you could do unique things musically because there's choice involved, um, different outcomes to to certain choices, things like that that you wouldn't be able to do in any other medium. Mm. Well, I think it's, you know, has largely to do with, with, um, with the structure of, you know, you, like the, the, the mu you don't, you don't structure mu the music in the same way, you know, you, you kind of realize that, you realize that, you know, again, your, mu your music doesn't have like, it doesn't, there's not the traditional kind of, you know, the, the chorus and the refrain and the bridge and all those, mm. you know, all those, those elements that can, <clears throat> you know, they often use for, um, for writing music. But I think um, this comes down to, well, what I've been thinking about basically the last five days <laughs> by myself speaking to no one is that music is, is, um, it's like not only is it a great way to tell stories and evoke emotions, but it's like it's it's really what a music can do so well is just to create a space and transform a space, yeah. you know. So, and this you can feel with with any music anywhere, like you know. So so, uh, I mean, I think I think everyone can relate to just like how putting on a you know, a song or any piece of music can, can completely transform the vibe of the whole room or the house or mm. the situation you're in. You know, music has it has the real power to do that. You know, and and um, and I think in this situation, what the music is really doing more than anything is 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 not it's not forming a structure. It's it's forming. It's building a space. You know, and I, and I think that's that's kind of the, and I don't know if it's that necessarily um, so different from from when you're writing music in general because I think this is what music always does. Like music always creates a space, yeah. but it's it's just that it's a it's it's a kind of different type of space, you yeah. know. And also when you're when you're working, like in this sense, when you're working with. Uh, literal elements that are the building blocks of the space that you're in in the game it it it, it kind of just like makes it even more more specialized than just like you know pure music with with, with uh, instruments if that makes sense this was exactly the way that i mean some of the some of the cues really require they have very specific kind of functions per se but when you when you think or when you're conceiving of music as just a specific kind of extension of the landscape as a whole, it's almost as though the music is 
or again, I think the way that we were thinking about it is that the levels exist and they're brought to light through various, you know, visual and sonic kind of devices. And just at that particular moment when we need to speak to a, a specific kind of emotional uh, development or a specific kind of development within the play of the game, you know, we want to get a form of tension, but also there's a melancholy in it. And the level just sort of, it gives the level this opportunity to sort of just breathe a bit and, and open up. But it's not like something is the beginning of the music cue. It's just that the level, you sort of turn around a corner and the level just opens up a little further. And, and that, I don't know, I think these are lots of ideas that if you were making an installation or something like that, you would you would think about because in installations, things can go on for weeks at a time. And there's something nice about that in a game as well. You can be in these landscapes for just so much longer than a cue in a film would ever allow you to be. So you just, you know, it gives the opportunity, maybe the level <laughs> breathes and opens, but it doesn't go all the way and it closes back down a bit. Open again, but you know, maybe you're going to get a bit further this time. Or uh, I don't know. That felt kind of a light to me. That's how and ultimately, uh, the players are in control of the soundtrack of the levels. Uh, ultimately, so uh, what a collection of of players and one team is doing is going to be ultimately reflected in how we play the music, be it through. Uh, s- like stinger cues when big stuff happens or whether one team is winning or losing. So it's it's not controlled by us, it's controlled by uh, our players. Andreas, I, I'm assuming you've worked with a lot of composers now who come out of a film and TV background that, that are trying out on a game. Is that fair to say? If that's happening currently or historically. If you have worked with several different composers who've come out of a background of, of film and TV, mm, not me personally, but Steve has been working with all the previous Battlefield composers, like okay. Iwana Yuka, and 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 they come from like uh, stage and and dance and that kind of composition, and and it's always been our ambition to to find the expression rather than the sound that we're looking for. Um, yeah. And that ultimately led us to Hilder and Sam because yeah, yeah, they I'm, they I'm, care more. They care a lot about process, and that's what we care about. Yeah, that was definitely something we all created. This little pandemic family over the last eighteen months. We our values when it came to music and work ethic and vision were very much aligned, and uh, and that's rare sometimes. Yeah, Tim, um, uh, it'd be more me i mean i i work with han zimmer and jacchino who started in games you know and leonard's and debney and all these guys who really before mm, never did never did games and i don't believe in the i don't know if this is your question but i'm going to volunteer this nonetheless i don't believe that um composers are game composers or film composers or television composers. Great composers are great composers. And composers um, are composers because it's not like they have a choice. When they're 17 years old, they don't go, oh my God, I don't know whether to be a composer or a dentist. It's not like there's a choice. It's a talent from another place that it is who you are, what you do, how you express yourself. And that talent um, you know, can be applied to any media. So we should never define, you know, composers to being film tell. I'm not saying you did, but so many people do. You know, they're a game composer, or they're oh, they do film composers. And then you got a guy like Hans Zimmer who shows up and he's like, This is the greatest thing I've ever done. I think I've worked on three projects with him. And um it's just a different way to apply your talent. It's a different way to express yourself. It's um, the learning curve. Um, it's it depends on your passion, you know. And um, we always have brilliant people, like in this case, Andreas, who become the middle ground to the you know implementation and the knowledge of what the medium can do. That's the that's the initial untethering. Oh, you mean I can do that? I don't have to do this? Well, you can do that, 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 and that, because we have to achieve this. So as long as in my role, as long as I always had 
a crazy talented audio director to work with. Then the dialogue between the composer and the game implementation, I always think, I'm not going to use the word easy, but it's, but it's um, deeply interesting and untethering. You know, um, now I don't even know what your question was going to be, but that was my answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that, that, it's very close. Um, I, I just gave you an answer. I made up the question and the answer. <laughs> I'm just thinking about like if if you're a composer whose primary background has been scoring for film and TV and and you're recruiting a lot of, of them. And obviously there's a there's a you know benefit there in terms of bringing some prestige, some names, some artistry, all the things that comes with recruiting someone with that background to the game. But then for them, you're kind of obviously kind of holding their hand and explaining, here's how this new medium works, if you're not familiar. But also, I'm just curious, what what are the things that you tell them to kind of get wet their appetite of? Here's the things you can do in this medium that you can't do in any other medium. Um, I, mean, I think we've touched on a lot of that stuff, but. Yeah, uh, but it's limitations. It's, it's, there are no limitations. I said it before. There's no picture. What is the story? We're, we're in the, I've said this already. We're in the business of storytelling. Hilda and Sam are in the business of storytelling. I'm in the business of story. I'm not in the game business. I'm in the storytelling business. But I could go work for a film studio. I could work for a television network or I could work for EA. We're telling stories. It's the, it's the tools to be able to tell them. And, um, you know, there's no limitations here. Like I said, I keep using picture, but I, you know, I think it's valid. I think there's just no picture. There's no story. Listen, Hilder is, you know, one of the many things she's known for is the fact that she's written music that has affected the scenes of films. Well, great. In this case, I would say that's even times X. The music affects the characters in some regards, you know, the music affects the story. And it's just not this game, it's the overall medium. I mean, you know, I've sat there and for years with composers and talked about what the characters could do, you know, what they could say. And I think it's that the fact that you come in in pre-production and you're a part of production and through post-production I think is a phenomenal place to be because you're one of the storytellers. You're not adapting music to what the writer did. You're one of the writers. Makes sense. Steve, while you're on your soapbox, um, <laughs> <laughs> what would Elder and Sam know I'm always on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> what would Steve, what would you love to see change in terms of just broad social appreciation, awareness, recognition of, of your industry and specifically music for games. Yeah, I mean, listen, this is an art form, okay? I, 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 we all get paid, isn't that amazing? What a gift, but uh, this is an art form. We're in the art business and art deserves recognition. And I'm not on my knees begging for recognition. Um, I always just find it interesting that there is an entire generation or two or, or three, where, as I mentioned before, this is the most important art form to them. This is the most important form of entertainment to them. So I would like some other places, you know, in the world of recognition, you know, I think the Guild has been a, done an amazing job. I think the SCL is doing an amazing job. You know, Graham is to, I'd, I'd like for other people just to catch up, you know, and realize that this is we can't be tethered to what once was. We have to acknowledge how amazingly fortunate we are to be in a world where there's all sorts of ways to express ourselves. Um, you know, aside from this, I work on FIFA. You know, the sports have changed because of games. The sound of sports have changed because of games. And go find me a 20 year old that, that tells you that Radio is his or her most important medium to rely on for discovery of music. It's just not going to happen. I mean, maybe you'll find one, but that person's dad probably runs a radio station. <laughs> you know, so um, recognition and not for a pat in the back, just for the acknowledgement, we all need to move forward, not be tethered to the past. And um, I, listen, I didn't know games from a hole in the wall when I took this gig 20 years ago. I wanted to be the head of music at a film studio. I had worked on films. 
you know, boy, it all worked out really well because I realized how much input Hilder and Sam said at best were. You can actually have an effect on the world. You can actually have an effect on the way people think and the way they act through the interactivity of the medium itself. So, you know, I'd like to see certain, um, you know, there's a lot of change that needs to happen in the world. Um, well, I'm sure in the future I have separate panels on the small single percentage of women that compose. I have a problem with that. Great, let's have change. We have a problems with climate change in the world. Great, let's have change. We can use this medium to affect that. I think it's that important because I think it's got the world's attention and certainly the part, world's participation. So um, yeah, my soapbox is pretty strong. Um, I think Hilder and Sam had to hear at least a weekly soapbox <laughs> for the entire Trump administration. I, I guarantee you that. <laughs> for every note that we wrote, we had a, I, I screamed about politics as well. I love that I see them laughing because it's, you know, we're through that for now. But yeah, that's my, I, I just, I want um, the world to that pay. That's a more interesting time for our dialogue. They, they, they <laughs> <laughs> say it again, say it again, say it again. What you the think? elections were an interesting time for, for our dialogue. Ooh, we had some discussions. We had to catch up sometimes in our music meeting going, wait, wait, we're supposed to work. Um, but anyway, I hope I made my point. You know, Tim, I think that um, this medium is worth looking at for everybody right now. This is not what your children play. Okay, this is, this is, I want to see... Dune like the next person. You know, I want to see the Bond film like the next person. But that's not just it. Well said. The little time left, there's a couple questions from the uh, from the uh, the guests here that I want to present. Um, Lucas asks, is the future of game composition leaning towards electroacoustic composition slash soundscapes and away from standard orchestral style video game music? I don't think, I think it's leaning to whatever serves the story. You know, I'm, I'm working on uh, several scores right now. Um, some are, listen, I'm doing Star Wars. That's very traditionally orchestral. It works. It's necessary. You know, it's classical, orchestral. Um, it would be a crime for me to suddenly add synths and guitars to Star Wars. Um, in the future, I'm sure in the next couple of years, I'll be working on Mass Effect, uh, another Battlefield, um, and others. And those we look at, you know, um, dependent on what serves the story best. And more importantly, like Andreas says, what serves the emotional response of the player best. Um, so I would say it's all of the above. I'll never put us in a box. Um, I'll always make sure that everything gets served the best, but we're not typical. I don't want to ever be typical. If it's a Sims score, which is quirky, um, then what does quirky, what can quirky mean? Quirky doesn't need to sound always like what quirky was. Quirky used to be, you know, Rugrats or Desperate Housewives. Quirky doesn't need to sound that way in the future. So pushing the envelope on any type of score, orchestral, electronic, whatever the case may be, as long as it's always unique and disruptive. Hildur, Sam, this one's for you from Steven. How do you know when you've got it and even when to stop on so, went on such a wide and open sonic exploration as we're seeing in that reel. You just stop when you have to deliver, basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the only, you know, the 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 answer and the problem, you know, is yeah. kind of good, like tied to each other. Like you know, at the end of the day, you're going to have a deadline, and you're just going to have to deliver, and that, that's yeah. that's when you stop. <laughs> yeah. And then you just, you know, and then of course, like, you know, you it's the same with, with this process as as any other, you know, creative process. It's just like you, you can go on forever, like you can continue doing revisions forever. And at some point you just have to, you know, you just have to go home and cook dinner. 
you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and you just have to kind of trust that, that your, that your intuition is, is going in the right direction, but you're always, you're always going to question it. You're always going to, I think no matter what medium you're working in, no matter what you're working on, you're always going to, mm. as a creative person, you know, no matter what instrument you're playing, what music you're composing, which level you're at in life, you're always going to question like, is this the right thing? Is this that, did I do enough? Did I do mm. too much? Did I, you know, and then, you know, at the end of the day with the more experience you have, the more you kind of just learn how to let go and, and trust that you're, you know, that you're hopefully, <laughs> hopefully going the right direction. <laughs> mm -hmm. The the medium may not be linear, but the schedule is, is what you're saying. Yeah. Uh, that's a very good way of putting that. Yeah. I mean, it's linear, so yes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But I have to say that the beautiful thing of, of uh, working in, um, in this medium, at least, you know, with my, with my limited knowledge and experience with it, is that it has a pretty wonderful working schedule, you know. It's, it's like great. We were in like we were pretty much in the same time zone, so we were having you know meetings at, at times where you were kind of half yeah. falling asleep, <laughs> and we had like you know we had weekly meetings, which was wonderful, where we like you know discuss the process, and then mm. we'd have a meeting you know on Tuesday the next the next week, and it was like a it was quite. A, a wonderful schedule actually yeah and I, I have to say the film world can, can learn a lot yeah. about the, the computer music game <laughs> schedule. I, th I think there's actually quite a lot to be said for me. we we just from the open discussions with andreas and, and the rest of the sound team we've just been in this 18 month long dialogue with some really genuinely awesome and excited minds of people just we've been having a discussion for 18 months i think that's kind of pretty unusual um yeah i don't know i think it's worth kind of highlighting it's just really nice to have that ongoing really engaging discussion for this amount of time with, with, with everyone in the sound team which doesn't happen i don't think in quite the same way so mm. yeah. Yeah. Anyway, this, this one's for anybody, I guess, but um, Esteban asks, do you think composers should be trained in the topic of generative algorithmic music? Would it prepare them for future professional trends? I think you just have to follow what you, you know, what, what, what you're interested in. I think, I think, you know, it's, it's kind of the, 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 the beauty and the curse of composing music today is that, you know, it's so, it's so accessible, like, you know, it's, it's, um, you, you can do so much yourself, but at the same time, that means you have to be, you have to know, like, so many different things, you know, which means that people rarely have a chance to kind of specialize in, 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 in the thing because they have to be like you have to be so good at like so many gazillion things and then the stuff that you're you're you know the program that you're good at all of a sudden change and then you have to learn a new program you know stuff, stuff like this so I think it just kind of I, I kind of if there's something that I could wish for the future is that that people would kind of just allow themselves a bit more space to to specialize a bit more to kind of just like you know follow up follow a direction and see it through because I mm. think I think uh you know so if you're really interested if, if that's your driving force like if you're really interested in algorithm like by all means like you know dive into it and just like know that you can follow that passion of yours you know and and hopefully you don't have to you know also be really good at MIDI orchestrations and classical orchestrations and playing the piano and the guitar and the you know flute and you know and, and being able to record everything at the same time you know which mm -hmm. is kind of what's sadly kind of expected of people today you know mm. so so I'd say you know I I I I wish for for people to be more kind of Specialist. I would also say within that expectation comes a, a, a often a reliance on on uh, 
a certain amount of algorithmic support. So within the world of like audio engineering, as we are all uh, musicians, composers, and engineers are expected to um, sort of be recording and mixing our own our own material much more. There is uh, an increasing amount of support from you know uh, algorithmic processes that will help you sort of um, master your own record. <laughs> yeah, which which don't get me wrong. I don't think we should be cynical about. It. I think there's some incredible incredible yeah, ways absolutely. that this interacts with, and you know, it's also not you know algorithmic music is not exactly invented in the last 10 years it's like you know it's it's a i suppose technically centuries old process it's just we're suddenly coming to a point where that you you know as we're all expected to do everything suddenly i'm like oh shit i'm just going to hit the mix button I'm like mix this for me and in that is a missed opportunity to to, to to learn how to use that you know to find your voice as a mixer or find your voice as a composer or whatever. So. Can we agree on that the hot new instruments of 2021 is salt and drums and uh, optics? Yes, I would, uh, you know, I, I will I will only practice salt from now on. Fire blankets. Salt and fire blankets, those are my, <laughs> the cello <laughs> is over. Does this mean that once this score is fantastically successful, barrels of salt will be available at a guitar center near you is that what you're suggesting you mean salt center <laughs> sorry they're going to change <laughs> the name that's how that's we're, we're all going to be fighting over these musical resources in 2042 salt's yeah. going to be the hottest commodity <laughs> um <laughs> to eat them <laughs> Well, I think that's a good place to tie it off. I think we've had a nice, uh, robust conversation about this specific title, about this music, about this amazing musical duo, um, but also some broader um, questions about about the future of games and and where game music kind of should sit in the uh, artistic ecosphere. So uh, lots lots more to uh, dive into after this, but. I want to thank Hilda and Sam and Andreas and Steve for uh, for participating in this. And um, yeah, thanks so much for thank having you. us. Thank yeah. you guys thank so you. much. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. Really lovely. Thank, thank you, Joel. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.